Yes, we got blue skies today. They're talking mid 60s. We're gonna have a beautiful day of harvest. I think today is day number 19, day number nine of corn harvest. This morning we're starting out. We got the skid loader on the trailer. Dad and I are heading to the cemetery. We gotta go dig up two graves. Cooper is gonna be working here at the bend site. He's got these two semis empty. He's got another one dumping right now. He's running wet corn out of the wet holding bend into the dryer right now. So hopefully when we get done with these graves, that will be empty, semis will be empty. We'll be ready to start combining some corn. It's actually gonna work okay that dad and I are gonna be running off and digging these graves this morning or digging them up. I don't really know what we officially want to call it or what it's officially called. But Combine Ryan is coming down and he is going to be putting on a different sieve for us on the back. Yesterday we discovered we had two different ones. He brought one out last night, but I guess that was the wrong one, so we had to bring it back and go get a different one. So he's gonna be getting that fixed today. Cooper is going to be making sure everything has got fuel in it. We don't sure, we are not sure if the fuel trailer is full of fuel or not. So if it's not, he's gonna see if the fuel guy is gonna be coming and bringing some out. Otherwise he's gonna have to go to those barrels and get some. And then Zach is going to grab a semi. He's gonna bring it out to the field. He's gonna get the grain carts empty. So that way everything's all empty out in the field when we get out there and actually get ready to rock and roll. Little backstory on these graves. We had a family member of two people who have been buried since the 1980s come to us asking if we would dig them up so that way they could move them to a different cemetery. So I believe a state official is going to be out there today. The funeral home's going to be out there. We're going to have the vault guy who's actually going to be lifting the vaults out of the hole. And then we're gonna be there because we have to dig the dirt off the top. Then we have to dig the dirt on the sides in order for them to get their cables underneath it to lift it up. Digging people up is not a very common thing. We've been digging graves my entire life and I think We've done it a handful of times. This is the first time we've ever done a double. So I've, I've never done one before. Dad's done one before. And I know a long time ago they did one when I was a little boy and when they got it out of the ground, it actually broke in half, which these ones are supposed to be a better concrete vault or so we're told, so that shouldn't happen. Hopefully that doesn't happen. The last time I remember this happening was actually like two years ago and they forgot to take the ring off of somebody who was buried so we had to dig them up so they could pop the lid off get the ring off and then we reburied them so it's kind of behind the scenes stuff you don't hear about a lot but it does happen every now and again and when i worked at the funeral home when i was in college we had one that came in the back that had been buried for 38 years they were moving it from iowa to California. And from my understanding, if they do not break the surface of the ground, you do not have to have a state official out there to move them. Because several years ago, we had a mom pass away, sister passed away, sister was buried by mom, one sister was still alive. She said, you know, I wanna be buried by mom. Could you dig the spot right beside my sister, slide her over so then when I get buried, I can be by mom? That actually happened. <laughs> yes, here we go on a first time experience for me. We got everybody over there by the flagpole. I'm not gonna film this, just out of respect of what's going on. I'll be back when we're done. There they are, we got them out. That's the dirt that was in the hole, and that's the hole. Our hole was about nine feet wide, 12 feet long, and about nine feet deep. So we had a lot of dirt there, we had a big pile. Got it cleaned up as good as we could. Once the grass starts growing through, we'll get this seeded and it, you won't even be able to tell this was here. Well, that was an interesting experience. They've been in the ground since 1981 and 1983. So everything had pretty much settled in all the way around them. There was a lot of clay at the bottom and it was wet. So it was just like a big old suction cup sucking them down. Kind of like if you've ever stepped in a mud puddle when you're wearing a rubber boot, and then when you go to step out, it just sucks the boot right off your foot if the mud's deep enough. So we had a little bit of a time getting them out. It's five o'clock. We got started at, dad started at 9.30 digging. So we've been at it for a while, but they're done. They probably should be at the new cemetery now. They already had the grave digger lined up at the next cemetery, it was an hour and a half away and they were gonna put them in the ground yet tonight. So they should have all that taken care of now. He's probably covering it as we speak. 
Yeah, that, that was interesting. It's gonna be pitch black in two hours. So dad and I are gonna head back to the main farm. We're gonna zip out to the north farm. Zach and Presley are running right now until we get there. Cooper and Presley are dealers for Franco for Brill and Pete Youngblood wanted to demo a corn head, so they brought our 12 row corn head over to Pete for him to demo because their normal demo corn head is on demo with somebody else. And so they got Pete set up with that machine. And then they went and grabbed their eight row demo chopping corn head and then they brought that to our machine. So we are going to be running an eight row chopping corn head. Head looks a little different than what we've been running. Got a new Franco head here. This is a prototype head uh, over in Argentina. They run all metal stints. So here we run poly. So this head will be switched to poly when they start selling these. Um, there's some differences on this head from the other one. We got a little rubbing here from the the shipping container, it appears. I'm not sure what happened here. Um, but anyways, this head's a little different. If we look underneath, we got choppers, chopper blades all the way across. Um, and then we got a lower back here. One thing nice about these choppers is, if you look back here, there's this little handle. You pull that out, twist it. You can disengage or engage your choppers. So if you don't want to run them, you can shut them off. Or if you want to run them, you can turn them on. You got all these rubber pieces back here. They kind of act as a stop for all the trash so it doesn't blow it way back. It's got the hydraulic roll cones on the side here. Um, not familiar with all this yet. I'll have Lucas show us how all this works. But the side panel opens up. Access the sides here. On this head, it's got the heavier chains than the other head. These are a lot thicker, heavier. And this also has a tool where you put on here that detensions it so you don't have to loosen the bolt up top so you can pop them right off. And then between each gearbox, there's a shaft chain. So instead of pulling a whole shaft out the end, you just take your chains off and then you can get to everything right there instead of having to pull the end gearbox off, pull all the way through. Also, it's got more of an aggressive stock roll on it. Hopefully help chop up the trash better, which I'm happy with the, the other head, how it's doing. So we're gonna fire this thing up. Get everything working. Los dos amigos están aquí. I think Sebastian's here and Lucas, Lucas for sure. And we are running an eight row head. That thing looks tiny. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien. Otro muy lindo día en Aire, ¿verdad? 30 dólares. Sí. Because you finally, you finally got me on a picture working, you know, so that's more expensive. That's hard to do. This is the brand new corn head, right, Lucas? This is the prototype with the, with the chopping system. Oh, this yeah. is prototype. Prototype. Can I even show this? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. You can. This is a chopping head, so if we look underneath, there's lawnmower blades that are standing right there. It's just chopping stuff up to bits. This thing is loud. This head's brand new, so just like with the other one, we had to set everything to our machine, so it just takes a little time. It sounds like it wasn't feeding in for them. So Lucas and Sebastian got everything taken care of. You slammed the door hard enough. Better go on. You just don't respect other people's things. So uh, what are we wanting to look at here with this new head that we're testing? Well, we are going to look at the um how the new gathering chains are set up because it has a new... Is it a bigger sprocket on the front? Correct. The okay. bigger sprocket that helps the crop moving into and then the chopping system will take them, will spray it all over and it's exciting man. I mean it's a brand new piece of equipment. We're pretty proud of it. It's been in development for the last three years in Argentina working in a different condition because we have a drier corn in Argentina. Sure. So this is the tough test, and I think that it's doing a good job. It's gonna test it out. Okay, here we go. It's funny, you run a 12 row and then you go back to an eight. 
You get used to the 12 real quick. We got one deck plate that needs some adjusting. This one is staying all the way in and all the other ones are moving. So basically this row is just not feeding and it kind of bunches up in here because the stocks are a little bit thicker than that. So you plug this row where all the other rows are working just fine. I was just visiting with one of my friends and he said he feels they're losing corn somewhere on their combine. They have basically the same combine as us. He found a hole up inside of here behind this chaff where the face plate does not fit tight to the actual corn head. So like right there, he feels grains falling out of that. Because you can see daylight on his. Once this chaff's out, you might on this one as well. I got a whole corn stalk in there. So I mean, there's definitely a gap because how else would that get in there other than through the front of the feeder house? But then he was driving along and he took a video up here, right behind this thing. He had grain falling out. Check this out. We got a bunch of chaff up in there. Look at all that corn that's falling out. How would shell corn get into there other than through the feeder house? So that is a leak. There's a male leak in there. Look at all that. Right up in there, there's that silver shaft that comes through. There's a race at the bottom of it for the bearing to sit inside of, and there's a gap. We just turned the machine on, and a whole bunch of stuff just comes flying out of there. So that is definitely a leak. If you got a flagship combine, take a look on yours when you're going along and see if you got a trail coming right underneath. Get the light out of the way. Right behind this thing. See if you got it. Because I know my friend does, and this is 2010, this is 2014, so. I don't know what we're gonna do. Maybe put some tape over it. We're not gonna mess with that leak right now. The Argentinians are leaving. We got everything fixed on the head now. That row's adjusted, so everything should work. Or at least it'll work until they leave, and then we'll have to call them back. I sent a video of the leak to Combine Ryan. We're gonna see what he says. We think it's coming around the bottom of the race of that bearing, so I don't know if there is an actual race that just got wore down, and that's what's leaking through, or if that how if that or if that is how it came from the factory. Maybe we just have to put some tape over it to basically block flow off. I don't know. I just, spinning shaft, chaff around it. I don't see tape holding, to be honest. I just got a pass through. I ran into our first problem with this being an eight row head. When I had the gray cart going in this path and I was over here, my auger actually stuck out over the grain cart because 20 feet wide was not enough room for it. And I also noticed See how we have some long stocks sticking up here? I was going like six miles an hour with this head, which the head ate it just fine. But the chopping was not able to keep up with six miles an hour. We have not got a frost yet, so the inside soft part of these stocks is wet. So just kind of something for the thought process there. Then the Champion 66 A22 right now. So we have 24 rows of this, and then we have 24 rows of 114 day right beside it. I'm noticing on this particular one, it's still green on the inside of this stock, it's wet. So when the corn head's pulling stuff down, I'm getting a lot of trash coming into the machine. So that's getting into the rotor. I'm having a more difficult time separating the corn from the trash. because I notice when I go fast, my rotor losses go shooting up, which is not what we want. So on the 116 day here, I have to slow down a little bit to about three and a half miles an hour in order to do a good job out of the back of the machine. But then the 114 day, I can speed up to about four and a half. That seems like that flows are pretty good. Just had a slip clutch go off on the left side of the head on that row right there. I don't know what's going on. Ricardo heard it and if he can hear it, you know it's there. I think it's this row here. It's gonna take it off for tonight, I think. supposed to be there that thing kicks out a lot and I also set the shield up there on that platform and it's now gone oh boy well we got that strip right there in the middle left that is a mile long pass I believe that's 48 rows so with this eight row head that is six downs and each down takes 15 minutes to do so that's what we got I got looks like two different hybrids yeah each one of those is a planter pl pass, so 60 feet a piece. It's kind of interesting looking at this farm in the yield map. We got all the green up here on the north end, and then 
basically once we hit that line which is basically where the hills start then it drops off real quick it's pretty fascinating down here there's definitely one hybrid that was doing better than the other one you can see each planter pass basically almost right to the line that's pretty incredible but then on this side up here it seems to be a lot more even once the sun starts going down at 7 p.m i'm good for a solid 16 hour day it's about midnight now Fully back in the morning. Good morning. Dad ran wet corn out of the hopper bottom bin into the dryer to about two o'clock last night. So we should have things fairly empty. We have this bin probably about up to there. So what we're gonna do, we turned on the auger. We're cycling everything back up into the leg then up top again. And we're dropping into that bin. So that way we can cover the floor and then we can start putting hot corn from the dryer in there and then we can blow air through it immediately the way those perforated floors work they need to be completely covered with grain in order for air to blow through them evenly because if you just have a pile in the center but the outside edges aren't covered yet then the air just goes to the path of least resistance it doesn't go through the grain it just goes right around why is there corn all over the ground over here what in the world that should not be the case that definitely came from somewhere up there. Oh, so this is the one we're putting grain into right now. So yeah, it piles up in the middle. So right now, if we were to turn the fans on, absolutely nothing would be blowing through that. It'd be blowing all throughout here. So if we have 130 degree corn in the middle, we don't want to have that sit there when we're pumping 300 bushels an hour into here and we need to get, let's say, 15,000 bushels in here before we can cover the floor, before we can turn the fan on. So what we're doing, we're just simply pumping out of this bin over here. We just got that auger on. It's pumping into this conveyor. This conveyor brings us up to the conveyor that's under the dryer, that one right there. The dryer is also feeding into it at the same time. Then that conveyor feeds up into the leg. So it's going up there. And then the leg is bringing in the conveyor across, and then we're dropping it in the bin. Won't be long, that'll be covered up completely. And it seems like a little bit of a double touch with the grain, moving it more than we should. It's actually not a bad thing we're doing it because we're also coning this bin out at the same time. When we drop the grain in, all the little tiny, tiny pieces go right to the center of the bin. And so you don't get as good of airflow right at the center channel because of those small pieces. So we're coning this out by taking out of the dead center. Now all those tiny, tiny pieces are going in there and they're getting more spread out. And then when once we get these filled up, then we'll cone both of them for the winter time so that way they store a lot better. Because usually if you have a hot spot or a problem, it's dead center in the bin from the fines. Last night when we found that bearing on the combine that was leaking, I called Combine Ryan, and he said there was a brush part that was supposed to be in there. So he's gonna come out this morning and get that in for us. Hopefully we can fix this leaking problem. Hey Ryan. <laughs> How are you? Good. Why are your hands so dirty? Well, because unlike you being a blister, I've been working on that. Oh. How's it saying go? Clean hands, dirty money? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> was that brush gone? Yeah, the whole plate was gone, actually. Oh, let's take a look inside of there now. Much better. Oh, wow. Okay, okay, perfect. Back at it in the 8-row Franco Fabril. I'm just running things nice and slow right now, getting the oil warmed up, getting the engine warmed up. Got a little chilly last night, so... Don't want to rush anything. This is pretty much all we have left here. This goes down an entire mile. So I'll dump twice with this eight row head going one direction. So basically by the time I hit the top of that hill, I'm dumping and then at the other end. Oh boy, we got the Georgians here. We got just one little row of shame left and then the North Farm is done. This is Warren, his family is over there. They are from Atlanta, Georgia. The best beards in the country. <laughs> I've been trying to get beard advice from him, but he doesn't have anything for me. He told me goat manure, but I don't really want to try that one. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do it that. So he's just riding around in the combine today. He's going to be a spotter. We're going to head down the road. We're going to have to go down the highway for a little bit. Cooper stole our trailer, so we're going down with a 20-foot wide head. And we got about five miles to go. So Zach's going to be blocking traffic for us in that grain cart. And then Ricardo's going to be behind us in that one. 
here we go. Better shift her up in the road gear. If you have a tracked machine and it goes super slow, hit that button that looks like two telephone poles. That's the high speed button down the road. It gives you an extra two miles an hour. This is why we have road blockers because we are literally from ditch to ditch right here. So nobody is getting around us. If we meet another combine, somebody's either gonna have to back up a really long way or pull into a field drive because we're not getting by each other. Oops, sorry car, you are not getting through this bridge right now. This is a textbook lesson of what vehicles should do when they see a tight area like this. Get off on the side so that we can get through. You got a lot of people that will sit right in the middle of their lane and just, it's like, yes, I can get around you, but why make it harder than it needs to be? Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Uncle Orleans again. We already got it half done. We just popped in on our first pass. I'm getting out, looking around. I think we need to tighten our concaves down. When we see this, this is not what we want. We're leaving yield behind. It's not fully getting off the ear. We're running a 23 concave right now. That's what I need to adjust. That's this button right here. We're gonna lower it all the way down to a, we'll try a 15. The bigger the diameter of the cob, the more we open our concave, the smaller the diameter of the cob, the narrower. So this is a narrower cob than what was on the North Farm. All right, wave bye to Warren, Carol. Marty, and I don't know Marty's wife's name. Marty's wife, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't remember your name. I really enjoy having friends and family come ride in the combine with me. I mean, I got a buddy seat there. We might as well utilize the thing. Gotta utilize that red Clint Corinthian leather. Might as well let somebody appreciate it a little bit. I've been here by myself pretty much all day. So it's nice when you can sit and talk with people. I like having people actually drive the combine because when you look at the combine, it's super big. Everyone thinks it's crazy intimidating. We're driving three miles an hour in the middle of the field. There's nothing you can hit. I'm sitting right here. If anything goes wrong, I'll just shut it down. And I do it all the time. So I like letting other people experience that because that is something that they never forget. Because sometimes people have never ridden in the combine before. And, and when I say, hey, we're gonna just make a pass across the field and it's your turn. Like, that is something they never forget. So Warren, thank you for coming out and riding with me. I need to get Uncle Orlin out here one of these days. We might have to get the ski loader outside the platform to lift him up to get him here. To get him up in the cab, the ladder may be a little difficult, but we're gonna figure out a way. Uncle Orlin's farm got hit with some wind. So there's some times where it gets pretty hard to row it. Right here is not too bad. It's standing up for the most part. I can still kind of make out a row when I look further ahead. But there's been a couple spots, kind of hard to see. We wanted to kind of prioritize getting to this farm first because we were concerned about the stock quality. If we were able to get some wind with a little bit of rain, being a dry year, we were just concerned with them being a little weak and it getting blown down on the ground. That's why we started here, and then we ended up getting into stuff that was too wet for our dryer, so we ended up going to Zach's and the North Farm, so now we're back here. And I think we're here at a pretty good time. You look right there on the field, you can see those diagonal patterns going across. There is a 36 inch gas pipeline and a 30 inch gas pipeline buried underground right there. Oh, where, oh, where is my row of corn at? Oh, there it is. Sounds like Pete Youngblood got done with the 12 row head for the demo. So Cooper just brought it back. We're gonna give this eight row head, get everything unhooked. Cooper is supposed to be coming with the trailer. We'll get this set back on the trailer, get this bat brought back to the Argentinians. What in the heck do we got going on here? What? We good. We ran an eight row head my entire life until three years ago, then we got a 12 row. And once you go to a 12, you do not want to go back to an eight. Every single time you make a round across the field, you have done an entire extra pass on the eight row. It just, the efficiency is nuts. Cooper's gonna bring the eight row Franco over to neighbor Denny who helped last year with harvest. We have to roll the face plate back on this combine again because this one sits differently with the Devastators than that one did. We have the head leg too flat. The Devastators on the back basically bear all the way to the head. The snoots don't touch the ground. And then you're maxing out the torsion springs on the Devastators and then you feel the chatter of the combine going across and we have an incredible amount of weight on there. The goal is to not have the head be lifting weight off the ground. We just basically want to have the Devastators rolling, knocking the stocks over. 
then let the tracks bear the weight. This machine doesn't have a fore aft hydraulically on it. We actually have to manually loosen these bolts and then they slide in that little slot there. So we're gonna loosen them. We have the head sitting on the ground now. And then once we lift up, it should pull this forward, which is gonna put us a little more nose down. Okay, here we go. Let's give this a try now. I think we got it going. Note to self, next combine we buy, it is having hydraulic fore and aft on it. This mechanical stuff, th this is 2023. We're getting way too soft for actually using our hands. I was just making the first pass across the field and it's doing like 240 and I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? And then I realized I still had it set for an eight row. So let's get it to where it's supposed to be. That looks a little bit more correct. So it, it, this farm's not doing phenomenal right now. Pretty thankful for auto steer right now because it's really difficult for me to see where the rows are. You think you got a spot like this where you can see and all of a sudden it just jumbles back up. The spot we're in right now, we got the champion 61A22. Not doing too bad. The other side of the field was doing anywhere from 110 bushels an acre to the best I saw was 220, but that was just for a second. Otherwise it was 200 and that was also just for a second. And it's pretty much like 175. So this area is definitely doing better, but it is mangled. That doesn't look right. But man, you step there, you grab there, you step there, you step there, and then you get ready for the big jump and you land carefully so you don't fall. Step, 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 step. It is 11.10. We have that row right there. The gathering change just stopped feeding and a whole bunch of material plugged up inside of it. All the other gathering chains are going. This one stopped even when I reversed it. Zach's looking on the back side. Ricardo's digging it out. I'm not sure what's going on, but this might be the end of combining tonight. This is what I mean. Watch the road to the left, see how it's moving. Then the one on the right, next to the one that's up in the air, in front of Ricardo, it is not. Dad just called. The leg, I guess, is plugged. I think we're just gonna leave this right here in front of the shop. That way Lucas and Sebastian can pull up with the truck right there. If they need tools in the shop, they can go in. This is a whole lot nicer working on this gravel versus a wet, cornfield. Now the one good thing about the leg plugging, well there's not really anything good about it, but the good thing is we have two legs. So the one that's running right now has hot corn coming from the dryer. That's currently going up top to the conveyors and it's feeding that bin over there. The west leg, which is the one that's plugged, is the one that the pit feeds. So we just can't unload any semis until we get that one unplugged. I guess dad was trying to fill the overhead bin and in order to go from the pit to the leg to the overhead, we have to turn the little conveyor from the leg to the overhead on. And he added on the automatic setting and it must not have turned on. So basically he dumped in the pit, went up the leg, and then the leg couldn't dump into anything because the conveyor to take it over to the overhead was not. That's a familiar sight. <laughs> There's a lot of corn in that thing. Yee. Got the leg unplugged. Now we're smoking those belts up there on the top of the pit auger. Oh yeah, be full, Clark. We're running the pipe wrench method right now. So Cooper sucks out a little bit. We can get about two of these. And then once that's done, then Zach will crank on it a few times and we turn it backwards to run the grain down. And Cooper will get a couple more out. And we'll try turning it on again from the electricity in there. And then we'll do this a few times and it usually goes. I think we've burned off like five sets of belts this year. Maybe not that many, maybe it was three. And there's four belts each time. And last year we probably did it like dog. All right, Ellie, we're gonna put you down in the bottom of the pit down there, and then you can dig all the corn out. Yeah. Another problem that we're running in with the pit is the fact that they came and monkeyed with it a while ago, and they cut a hole in the side. So there's a hole in the side, and there's a hole in the very bottom. And when you go and shut the slide gate right here, it doesn't actually completely shut the bottom hole. It only makes it like half shut. The top hole shut, but the bottom one's not. So you really can't 
shut the flow of grain off to this auger. So like in this case here, when we're plugged, like we constantly have grain in the auger no matter what we do. When the belts spin, it kind of glazes them over and then they basically don't have the traction on them anymore that they should. So those belts are shot. We're just gonna try cranking them up super tight. See if we can get this thing at least running. The bottom of the pit emptied out. And then probably have to put some new belts on. Oops. Dad made some supper in the dryer shack. He's gonna eat that while stuff's still running. And then once he gets done, he'll shut her down for the night. It's about one, I think it's one, uh, 1.03 a.m. right now. I know it seems like we've been having some fits with this Franco head. And I mean, stuff happens with all sorts of new equipment. The nice thing about the Franco stuff is Lucas and Sebastian are phenomenal. They're like they literally answer the phone anytime and they'll just come right out. Yep, we'll, we'll get you taken care of. And they do. And this head does have a three year warranty on every single part on it, other than the head sight sensors because that is not made by Franco. But otherwise, everything else is. So, I mean, we're not having to pay for these problems. We just have the downtime. Dad and I were just talking about this. It seems like every new item that's been out here has literally broke on us just by us running it for a short amount of time. The Petty Bone Telehandler had the deaf sender thing that went out so it wouldn't run. The Case Backhoe that we ran, they would just randomly shut off on us. The John Deere combine we ran last year, that S790, basically the whole sieve system exploded on the back and then they brought out a, a 780. The John Deere planter, we were having issues with the hydraulic downforce. I think there was three of the little control module thingies that ended up plugging up and they had to come out each time to fix those. We had a new skid loader demo and it would just not turn on sometimes. Everything would light up, but then you hit the key and it would do nothing or you turn on, it would idle for 10 seconds and then it would just shut off. So, I mean like literally brand new stuff. <laughs> Breaks. This is not the first thing that we've had issues with. That was brand new. So we'll get it ironed out and it'll get working and then it'll be great. But anyway, we have a busy day tomorrow. I'm gonna go on and get some supper, hop in the shower. I'm going to bed. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.